Hi. In the last video, we were exploring the Towers of Hanoi. That's a puzzle where you take a stack. I've got coins here, but it can be lots of different objects. And the goal of the puzzle is to move the stack of coins from this circle to the third circle, moving only one coin at a time, and never being able to put a coin, a bigger coin, on top of a smaller coin. And what we did is we were what we were interested in was what are the minimum number of moves in which to do the puzzle and we ended up producing this table here where the column on the left represents the number of coins in the stack and the column on the right the number of moves it took, the minimum number of moves it took to move that particular stack of coins. And in the process of developing this table we ended up producing this what we call a recursive formula and that is it's a formula that's defined in terms of its previous term. So let me explain that. So for instance, if I wanted to know how many moves it took to move three coins, what I need to do is take two and multiplying it, multiply it against the number of t moves it takes to move one less than three, which of course is two coins, and add one to it. So to find the number of moves it takes to move three coins, it's two times the number of moves to move two coins plus one. And you can see that works over here. Uh, three, two coins is three moves, 2 times 3 is 6, plus 1 is 7, and then 2 times 7 is 14, plus 1 is 15, and 2 times 15 is 30, plus 1 is 31. And we ended up producing this table, and we ended up also in the process of doing it, proving this formula. We know that this formula will work for any number of coins, and if you've forgotten all that stuff, you can go back and take a look at the previous video. But in looking at these numbers, we discovered a second pattern, a second one right here, which seems to be working. And it's not a recursive formula, it's what we call a general formula. Because it's not defined in terms of previous terms, it's just a straight out formula. You put the number of coins in for the n and work it out. I'm sorry, this should be my error. That minus one is not in the exponent. Subtract it afterwards. So for instance, if I want to know how many moves it took to do five coins, it would be two to the five, which is 32 minus one, which is 31, which is right there. And if you go through the numbers we have here, you will produce all the numbers we have there. So at least for the first six coins, this formula seems to be working. But we never proved it. And what we want to do is we want to prove this formula. We want to prove that this formula works all the time. Now we do know that this formula works. So basically, I want to connect these two together. Okay? I want to connect this formula that I know works for a fact to this formula that I would like to prove works all the time. And I want to prove it for all possible values of n, at least all the natural numbers. A little bit of terminology. When we make these types of statements, what we're saying is, if this is true, then this is true. That's the kind of statement I want to prove to be true. And this part that we know to be true, the beginning part of our statement, we call the premise. And this piece of it, we call the conclusion. Okay? And what we want to do is make a statement like, if this premise, then this conclusion. Okay? Mathematics is full of these if-then statements, okay? these linkages together. In fact, all of mathematics is built upon that, upon starting with something that's a premise, and then from that using rules of deduction to draw a conclusion. And then that conclusion can be used as a premise for further deductions, and in the process of doing that, we end up building all of mathematics out of those types of structures. So what I want to do is prove this statement, if this, then this. What I'm going to do, though, is prove a related statement, and I'm going to show you how it connects in just a little bit at the end. Okay? I want to prove this statement, if mk equals 2 to the k minus 1, then, and notice by the way, all I did here was take the formula that we want to prove and replace the n with a k, then m to the k plus 1 is equal to 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1 for all k uh, do we start at 1? No, let's start with, yeah, uh, greater than 0. So all k greater than, 
all positive values are okay. And when I say that, I'm talking about the natural numbers, no decimals or rationals or anything like that. And we'll just go with that as, as a given throughout this particular process. So this is what I want to do. So this statement here is my premise. By the way, I don't know that premise is true yet, but we'll sh I'll show you how this connects in the end. And this guy here is my conclusion. I want to prove if that's true, then this is true. And what I'm going to do is something a little bit unusual uh, for what I would normally do and try to prove something is I'm not going to explain what I'm doing. I'm going to do this statement and at the end explain how it works and explain how that gets us what we want to do. So basically, even though I don't know this is true, I'm going to for now assume this is true just to prove this particular statement. If this is true, then this is true. Okay? So, what are the things that I know? Well, I got this because this is my premise. This is what I'm assuming to be true. And I also know this statement here for a fact because we proved that in the last video. And what I want to do is, with these two together, produce this statement. And actually, this proof is not a very long one. It's very short, so you don't have to bear with me for very long. I'm going to start with mk plus 1 equals, and I want to produce this statement over here on the right side. But all I, what I got here is this statement. If I take this statement and replace the n with a k plus 1, I will get mk plus 1 equals 2 times m, and here it's n minus 1, but I'm replacing the n with a k plus 1, so it'll be k plus 1 minus 1, which is just k plus a 1. So I got this statement. M k plus 1 is equal to 2mk plus 1. And then I have my premise here, underline it once again, this guy, that's my premise, and I got an mk is also equal to 2 to the k minus 1. So I'm going to replace the mk with a 2 to the k minus 1 plus a 1. And then this falls apart pretty quickly, because if we multiply out the brackets, Think of that as a 2 to the 1. I have two powers with the same base, and I have a rule for exponents that says if I multiply two powers with the same base, I can combine them into a single base by adding the exponents. So 2 to the 1 times 2 to the k is 2 to the k plus 1, just adding those two exponents together. And then finally, I'm going to take 2 and multiply it against negative 1. That's a little more straightforward. That's negative 2 plus a 1. And then negative 2 plus 1 right here, of course, is negative 1. So I get 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. And if you notice, that's exactly what I wanted right there. Okay. So this is the same as that. So this statement here, I now, whoops, I guess I should have included the k equals 0. I now know that that statement there is a true statement. But it all hinges on that being true. Well, it turns out that's okay. And here's why it's okay. Whoops, got the wrong color. Got to draw a line right down here. I know that this formula here works for six. If I put six into here, this produces the correct number. Two to the six is uh, two to the six is sixty-four minus one is sixty-three. And that's it right there. So I now I do know that that formula works for n is equal to 6. So m6 is true. Now let's consider this statement that I have in blue. And replace the 6 with a k. If m6 equals 2 to the 6 minus 1, which is true, it's right there, then k plus 1 would be 7. Then m7 equals 2 to the 7 minus 1. So in other words, because I know that it works for 6 coins, oops, that should be a 7, and because I proved this statement that I squared off in blue, I know now for a fact it'll work for 7 coins. I don't have to do the arithmetic. I don't have to figure it out and move coins around or anything. I know that for a fact because of this. And if it works for 7 coins, replace this, the k with a 7, if m7 equals 2 to the 7 minus 1, which I now know to be true, boink. then, putting 7 in for the k here, 2, 8 equals 2 to the 8 minus 1. In other words, I know that it works for 8 coins. And now I'm hoping people will say, see, this keeps going. That means it's going to work for 9 coins, because I know it works for 8 coins. That means I know it works for 10 coins. 
for 11 coins, and in fact, for as large a stack of coins as I want. I know that this formula will work all the time. Okay? We call this style of proof, proof by induction. And an inductive proof is a very, very powerful and common tool in mathematics. It's a way of taking a statement and proving it for all possible numbers without actually having to check all those numbers, which is clearly impossible. And it works in two steps. Step number one is to prove, actually you could do these steps in either order, but the step, the order I did it, is to prove this statement. To prove that if it works for case K, then prove that it works for K plus one. And what that does is it links together consecutive cases. So now that I know that two, if, if one case is true, I know that the case right after that will be true. And then what I need to do is show that it works once. Preferably actually the first one, but I went right to the sixth one because we'd already done it up to six. But if you can show any of these work, then you know all the ones after that work. Okay, Proof by mathematical induction. An analogy that people often use is in setting up a row of dominoes. Right? What you're doing when you're making this statement is you're setting up a row of infinite dominoes all in a line, all lined up like that. And then all you have to do is show that it works once. Knock over that first domino. Show that one of these works. And then all the other dominoes get knocked over automatically. So proof by mathematical induction. So now I've got this link. I now know that this formula, this general formula here, um, will work all the time. So now if I wanted to do my 50 coin Tower of Hanoi, I know that I can put 50 into this number in for the end here and go 2 to the 50 minus 1. I'll leave that for you to do. It is a ridiculously crazy large number that I can't imagine anyone ever doing in their lifetime. In fact, what might be a fun exercise to do is why don't you figure out how long it would take somebody to do it. Let's see. If, let's say they take one coin a second doing it like that. Figure out how many moves this is and then figure out how long it would take them to move that stack of 50 coins. It's a fun exercise for you. I'll leave that for you though. What I want to do though is look at something else. Mathematics is all about noticing patterns. It's all about seeing patterns and then proving those particular patterns and we're doing that here. Here's a pattern that you may or may not have noticed but it's an interesting pattern. It's a subtle pattern but it's interesting. I'm going to ignore the first row here. I'll get to Y in just a second. And then I want to take a look at this number and this number, 2 and 3. And although it might not be completely obvious, both these numbers are prime. 3 is prime and 2 is prime. All right, you might go, yeah, so what? Big deal. Well, let's look at the next one. 3 is a prime number, and so is 7. 4 is not a prime number, and neither is 15. 15, of course, is 3 times 5. And maybe I should stop just for a second, make sure everyone who's watching this video knows what I mean by a prime number. A prime number is a positive integer, bigger than 1, that cannot be broken down into smaller integers being multiplied together. So in other words, you can't divide anything else into it other than one in itself. Okay? And that's why I discluded the one. I took that one out, the one at the beginning, because one is not prime, but I just don't want to get into that discussion. So there we go. Let's go to the next one. Five is a prime number. Can't break that one up. And so is 31. Six is not a prime number, and neither is 63. There's a number of ways of breaking it down. You could go like, for instance, seven times nine. Interesting. I wonder if that keeps going. Let's go one more because I, the next number, 7, 7 is a prime number. Does the number we get here also come out to be prime? You can use either of these two formulas now. Both of them work. You can take 63 and double it and add 1. Or you can take um, 2 to the 7 and subtract 1. doesn't matter which way you do it, but either way you're going to get the number 127. And although this might take you a little bit of time, well, a little bit of time, playing around with a calculator, it won't take you long to realize, yes, that is prime. Prime number. 
and so is 7 fourths. And here we have prime. And here we have a prime. So at least, you know, once I got the ones out of the way and started working down at least up to 7, every single time the n was prime, the number of moves it took to move that stack coins also turned out to be a prime number. I wonder if that keeps going. That's going to have to be a topic, though, for the next video.